We are in Ephesians chapter 3, starting at verse 14. If you want to open there, that's where we'll be. We're only going to go over seven verses today, but they are a power-packed seven verses full of prayer. So it's a prayer, Paul's, but we're also going to learn how to pray for others and get prayed for ourselves. We'll tell you more about that as we get into it. Um, My voice is a little scratchy, a little tired, and I'm a little emotionally just kind of all over the map. The last three days have been the celebration of Boogie Rose, who was a pastor here at the Shoreline, then Planted Branches Church, who's also a good friend of mine, who most of you know by now has passed away recently, but the last three days were three different events for his celebration of life, and yesterday was right here in this room, and it was packed all the way out to the, to the parking lot, actually, uh, over full. And, um, but the first day was also a paddle out, and I was standing on a lifeguard tower, and there was, the, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people, so I was screaming from that lifeguard tower, and I nearly lost my voice. So if I, if, I, if I break out or break back in or whatever, just have grace for me today, and if I, if I choose to cry at something weird, and you're like, what just happened to him right there? It's probably just some random leftover processing going on inside of me, because I love my brother so much. So thank you for your grace in all of that. As we talk about prayer today, Paul's prayer is also about spiritual growth. So we kind of have two topics in front of us today. One is praying and how to pray, just the raw prayer that he's doing. The other is the content of his prayer, how to pray for spiritual growth. The fact is every single one of us that's here today is probably in one of two states of spiritual growth. You are either in a state of good spiritual growth right now. You feel it, it's momentum, it's intentional, you're loving it, you're growing spiritually, or you're drifting or sliding away spiritually, and you're also aware of that. There's some, there's some doubts, there's some questions, there's some hurts, there's some pains, there's some struggles, difficulties, and, and you're falling away. There's a third group of you, though, that says, I kind of feel like maybe I'm plateaued a little bit. Like, I'm, I'm not going forward, but I'm not going backwards, and here's the bad news for you. To be plateaued spiritually is to be going backwards without knowing it. That's the sad thing. The intention is that all of us would all of our days till our final breath be growing spiritually. God wants us all to be growing spiritually. And so that's why this is such a a powerful prayer uh, for us to look at today. Our prayer life is really important. All of you pray to some degree. Whenever you hear about prayer, most of you feel guilty to some degree. How's your prayer life could be the most challenging question any of us could ever get. Any of us. It's like, ah, not what it should be. Needs to be more. Billy Graham, on his, on his deathbed, they asked him, they said, what would you do more if you could do it all over again? He said, pray more. I would pray more. It's like, don't be guilty about that. Come on. But you can feel it. It's something that we hear about all the time. So today is an invitation to step into that prayer life deeper and more and especially in some deep ways. Because the fact is that our deepest cares and concerns, our deepest hopes and dreams, all make their way into our prayers. Think if you got a diagnosis that was concerning or even devastating, how quickly that would move into your prayer life regularly, or when somebody else around you does. And how quickly when you're praying for someone to be healed that you get that onto other people's prayer lists as well. Why is that? Because it's a deep concern, it's a deep care. We all pray about things that we deeply care about. If you want to know what you care about, what you're worried about, uh, listen into your own prayers. Just examine them. What you're writing down, what you're praying, what you're saying, you're going to hear what's going on in your own heart. Your prayers mirror the concerns and hopes and dreams of your own heart. So this is kind of helpful when we get to Paul's prayer because we get to see what was on the Apostle Paul's mind and heart and what was deeply concerning to him. And I'll just tell you flat out, when I first read this as a young adult, this prayer of Paul's in Ephesians chapter three, the ones we're looking at right now, 14 to 21, challenged me because I had never prayed for someone's spiritual growth before because I figured that was God's job to grow people spiritually. I didn't have to pray about that. Why pray about what God is doing in someone's life? And then I read Paul's prayer and I thought, he sincerely got this on his prayer list, like that God would grow them and, and minister to them deeply and that they would experience God's love and all this kind of, and I thought, I don't think I've ever prayed that for anyone else. And it, so th- this prayer here changed my particular prayer life when I was a young adult and continues to change it to this day. So what Paul was thinking about, he wanted his believing friends in Ephesus to employ the empowerment that they received from their faith in Christ. 
He wanted them to live into the new reality that they were the dwelling place of Almighty God on earth. And that's a big thought. And so how do you take these big, knowledgeable things that are, that are like, I don't know what that means. How do you get what's in your head into your heart? John Corson is a pastor, and he said, so many have knowledge in their heads, but it hasn't dropped the important 18 inches into their hearts. So how do we get knowledge from our head to our heart? Through prayer. Paul says, I bow my knee and I pray. He said, I could give you all the head knowledge of chapters one, two, and three, but my prayer is that all that knowledge will make its way into your heart. Now, what's the difference between knowing in my head and knowing in my heart? Well, our hearts, when the Bible talks about our hearts, we talked about this uh, last time we talked about prayer uh, three weeks ago. Our heart is actually the control center of our life. It's not only do we decide things in our heart, but we take action. It's our will is in our heart. The Bible says, guard your heart for from it is the wellspring of life. Your direction, your feelings, your desires, your thoughts, everything gets prioritized and sorted out in your heart. So he's saying, I don't want you to just have big Bible heads. I want you to have gigantic hearts that make decisions to live your life out for Christ. He's really talking about just getting into the motivation of their hearts that they would live it. So keep that in mind. The word power shows up four times in these seven verses. Power to know, power to experience, power to be strengthened, all kinds of different ways. So just know that as we read through it. Let's read from Ephesians 3, 14 through 21 straight through and just let it minister to us. Here we go. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now all glory to God, who is able, through his mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever, amen. Isn't that an incredible seven verses? power packed in there, filled with prayer for power, the power to know, power, power to experience, power to be empowered. It's like he's just hitting it, that you would seek God for these things through prayer. That's how powerful prayer is, by the way. So let's start with the proper approach to prayer, because some of us may not know, how do I begin praying? Paul gives us a great approach here in verse 14. He says, let's say this, go directly to the Father in full submission. That's what we're saying. Here's what Paul said, when I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father. What was the all this? You go back to 3, 1, and that's the phrase, when I think of all this, and then he diverted all the way down to verse 13, and now he comes back to it. When I think of all this. So all this is found in chapter 2. We know well what he's been talking about, how Jews and Gentiles come together to make up the body of Christ by their faith in Jesus. Gentiles are grafted into the promises of the Jewish people. We become one in Christ. And he's like, when I think of all this, Jews and Gentiles living together by faith in Jesus Christ in the same body filled with the same spirit, with the same Lord, he's like, it's so marvelous. When I think of all this, it, God's will is so magnificent that when I think of all this, how do you respond? He goes, I fall to my knees and I pray to the Father. Prayer is the proper response to learning and knowing God's will. Think of how important that is, that Bible study always should bottom out in, in Bible truth prayer. The two just go together. They're like wings that hold you up together. 
When you know God's will, you pray it into your heart. And prayer is the way it doesn't just stay in my head, but gets down into my decision making. Even if I don't understand what God's word says, by prayer I can ask him, would you teach that to me? I don't fully understand what it means to have your power and not my own, because I have a certain amount of power that you've given to me. Am I supposed to be my power? Your, Lord, would you, this is mysterious, show me how to do this. How does this all work out? You can even ask him your questions in prayer as you're sorting this out. But I really love that, that knowing God's will and talking about God's will caused him to pray. Uh, one, uh, two writers said this. They said, prayer is not a place to be perfect. It's a place to be honest. And I really like that. Just, just as you're approaching prayer in your own life, it's an honest heart before um, a listening God. And you just pour it out to him. The other thing that he said is, when I think of all this, I fall to my knees in prayer. Which is interesting because the typical Jewish manner of standing or praying would have been to stand and lift your hands to heaven and pray like that. So to kneel was actually, I mean, Daniel knelt, and there's a lot of kneeling prayer in the Bible, but it was was unusual because kneeling actually brought with it more intensity, more submission, more humility, and more reverence. So it was an intensified form of praying. So I find that to be kind of interesting, and I don't know if you've ever changed your posture in prayer or not, but imagine if somebody walked up on the stage, and it was somebody you guys didn't know, and when he got to stage, I went like this, hey, what's up? Mm. And you guys would go, oh, they're friends. Those guys are friends. But imagine a person walks up on stage that you don't know, and I go, oh, my gosh. And you go, who in the world is that? Because there's a total difference between broing out with somebody and falling to your knees in, in submission, right? You know immediately that there's something different about that person. And here Paul's saying, When I think of how magnificent it is that the church under Jesus Christ is people from all different places brought together in the same body, he goes, man, I fall down to my knees before the Father. And and there are things in the scriptures that are going to cause you and I to just surrender and just say, Lord, it's too beautiful for words. Show me how to live that out in my life. Let me have a life that corresponds to that truth. And the only way that's going to happen is through prayer. That's why prayerlessness, the Bible says, is a sin for believers. Far be it from me to sin against you by not praying for you, it says. And so you and I, as as people of prayer, are intensifying our prayers as we become knowledgeable of God's word. So these, these thoughts drove Paul to his knees. Last thing, he says, when I think of all this, I fall to my knees and I pray to the Father. And um, <clears throat> that, that, that would have been huge, to, especially to the Jewish people in that body. and Well, Gentiles as well, but the Jewish people wouldn't even pronounce the name of God. So you guys know that God said to Moses, who do I tell them sent me? And he said, tell them I am has sent you. I am is four letters, uh, Y-H-V-H, the, the tetragrammaton as it's called. But you and I would pronounce it as Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh or, or something like that. The Jewish people would not refer to God by his covenant name, Yahweh, so they would call him Hashem, which meant the name. So it would be like, yeah, approach the name and ask him, because out of reverence they said, you don't pronounce his name. And here comes Jesus with his disciples, and they say, Lord, you're always praying, and we we respect your prayer life. It's, It's amazing. Lord, teach us to pray. And he says, pray like this, our Father who is in heaven. May your name be kept holy and may your kingdom come and your will be done. And on he goes to teach his disciples to pray. But he started with that same phrase, our father. He started with this incredible relationship. You can go to God and say, almighty creator. There's no, God has no problem with that at all. It's a lot of the Psalms do that. You could go to him and say, say almighty, all powerful being named God. You can start your prayers like that all you want and you're okay. You're on good ground. Because that's true, and that's who he is. However, when you come to faith in him through Jesus Christ, the relationship has intensified into a family relationship, and he also wants you to recognize not that he's just distant, almighty God creator, but that he has become your father, and that you share that with others. That's why Jesus said, our father, I'm in community with you as my father, Jews and Gentiles together in a body. 
our father, I have some things I'd like to talk to you about. It's interesting because in Aramaic, the word father is Abba. And it would be very similar to our English word, Papa. And I have friends who it's, they're in the habit of praying like that. I, I don't typically, but it's okay. I, like, I, I always enjoy it when, when people, when we're like, okay, let's pray. And one of my buds will go, oh, Papa. And I'm always like, I know, I know, where, that, I know where that heart's coming from. You're pressing into the relationship of how much you love God as Father. Oh, Papa, some stuff on my heart. And typically those are people who have had pretty good father relationships on earth that kind of transitioned over into. I have a tendency to pray pretty directly when I open my prayers. Dear Father, our Father, in Jesus' name, we come before the throne. I come before the throne. I often will start with that relationship just to remind my own heart in submission, in reverence, who I'm talking to and what's been established through faith in Jesus Christ and what a privilege it is to be in prayer with him. Whenever you pray, know this. You can let your words reflect this. You are praying to a triune God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Look at just, I pulled the phrases out and put them together of Paul's prayer, but look how he did it. He said, he will empower you with inner strength through his Spirit, the Holy Spirit. In verse 16, Christ will make his home in your hearts. Christ in verse 17. And then in verse 19, you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from, and he refers to God. That would be God the Father. So he, he refers to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in his prayer, but he starts with Father. Um, so, all right. Now that we're clear on the approach to prayer, what does he actually pray about? And we have three prayer requests. Number one, let's start with the first. His first is pray, and I put it like this, pray for people. So you can look at Paul's example of how to pray. That's one way to learn today. You can also look at what kind of prayer request should I be asking other people for, for me to grow into the content of the prayer. So pray for people and get prayed for to grow spiritually strong. You and I should all have our heart and mind on this of spiritual growth. No plateauing and certainly no backsliding. He says, I pray from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. That's two Greek words put together. The first one is kratos, and uh, that's he would grant you to be strengthened. It's a passive verb. It doesn't mean go out and strengthen yourself. <clears throat> it means ask him to strengthen you so that you would be strengthened, kratos, with power, and that's the word that you've heard over and over and over again, dunamis, where we get our word dynamite from. So pray that God would grant you the strengthening, the empowering by his dynamite power. God's superpower, come empower you. Empower you with inner strength through his spirit. The Holy Spirit is God's agent of power for you and I. When Jesus went to be with the Father, he said, I will send you the Holy Spirit. He'll lead you into all truth. He will comfort you. He will guide you. He'll be the one who comes alongside to help. He'll teach you all things that I have taught you. He will bring to remembrance. He will strengthen you. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace. He'll bring the character of Christ out of you. So the, so the Holy Spirit comes in and empowers and does the work that Christ taught and that the Father sent. And Jesus said it this way. He said, he, the Holy Spirit, will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. All that belongs to the Father is mine. And this is why I said, the Spirit will tell you whatever he receives from me. So notice that. Jesus says, the Holy Spirit's gonna apply what me and the Father have decided and taught. So the Holy Spirit doesn't draw attention to himself. He's always shining a light on Christ and the Father and what they've taught to you and I. He glorifies. He takes from Jesus and the Father and he applies it to you and I. He is the, uh, the comforting bridge and the voice and the heart of God sent to us directly. So let me just say something to you directly while we're here together in church on a Sunday in worship. Just receive this. God wants you to experience his power. He wants you to experience his power. If that sounds scary to you, or if that sounds overwhelming to you, just surrender that even in prayer. You know, it's the, like the person who says, man, I never wanna pray about becoming a missionary to Africa 
because as soon as I pray that that wouldn't happen, I know God's going to send me as a missionary to Africa, so I'm just going to avoid the whole topic. And I think God's power is a little bit like that sometimes. Like, no, I don't want to experience God's power. I like to be in control of my own little world. I don't want him to bust things up and cause me to whatever, do whatever. You know, I don't want him in charge. I trust me more than him. And you can see where that might be a wall, a barrier, an inhibitor to your spiritual growth is to trust him to empower you. Invite him in to give him. He wants you to experience, not just know that he's powerful. Feel it, live it, apply it, give it. He wants you to step out in his power. You and I are going to be overwhelmed if we try to live our Christian faith in our own strength. We're going to just be overwhelmed. But if we'll trust in God and rely on his power, he will. He will give us his mighty power. There was something uh, I've been thinking about recently. And is, have you ever tried to live your Christian life in your own strength? Have you ever tried to just say, like, like determined, kind of like, okay, there's a lot of people in my church who are strong and mature Christians, and I am going to become one. So I'm going to knuckle down. I'm going to grit my teeth. I'm going to hold on tight, white knuckle this thing, and I'm going to make the changes, and I'm going to start making resolutions and writing them down. I'm going to start doing it. I'm just raw doing my power, strong Christian, right around the corner. Fast forward a month or so, and it's usually gone one of two ways. Not, you're not a stronger believer. Usually your rules and legalism, and you've set up a bunch of rules that you keep and you become a religious rule keeper, or you said, I keep trying and failing, I keep trying and failing, forget it, and you went loose, take license, you went, this can't be done, and so I'm going to just do whatever I want. You either kind of went into religious legalist person or licentious, I just do whatever, I, I'm not going to be able to do it, this whole Christian life is not for me. That's usually about a month down the road from the gritting your teeth, white knuckling, I will be a stronger Christian. And you go, well, then how do you become a stronger Christian? It's not by your own willpower that you will become a stronger Christian. It will become on you recognizing your own weakness to even live this out as a husband or a wife, as a parent, as a coworker, as a friend, as a neighbor, any of this, and say, God, in prayer, would you strengthen me with your power? that I could start to have your word in my mind and your desires in my heart and start to be motivated from within by you, empowered, motivated, taught by you, and that you would change me from the inside to the outside. Think of it by way of analogy. When you're young, you are so gifted with spiritual strength. Most of us had incredible spiritual strength when we were younger and teenagers. And I, I, don't, I forget, it's like 20-something years old. You're at like peak physical strength. And because of that, you tended to rely on your physical strength for everything. Your physical strength was how you enjoyed life, how you interacted with others, what you did for fun. And it's like you helped at church or whatever. It was all physical, physical, physical. And then your physicality as you got older started to break down. And that was, doggone, this knee is not doing what it should. Shoot, where'd that disc go? Right about there when I walk. And then, and then the next thing you go, what the heck happened to the hormones? Because that didn't used to just grow when I ate like this. And now it does. And you just go, what is happening? And the Bible puts it like this. It says, though the outward man is wasting away, the inward man is being renewed day by day by day. And so what you find is when your physical strength begins to wane or slide away or not be something you can count on for life and enjoyment and activity and all that kind of stuff, you start to become spiritually stronger over time, more wise, um, more prayerful, um, more spiritually entrusting yourself to God's strength, praying for others, more, more helpful in ways that come out of the inside of who you are. And for me, that's a really good analogy, just looking at the natural flow of, of physicality, that spiritually you could take a teenager and if they learned that lesson and they said, it's not about, life's not about my physical ability, although praise God for it, I'm gonna use it greatly, but life is about my inner, my inner soul strengthening and developing through prayerful connection with Christ and God's word. If a teenager grabs that, they will become spiritually mature even in the midst of their great physicality. 
So it becomes like an analogy for us to say, really what it's about is that we'd be strengthened with God's strength on the inner person of us, and that our, our soul, mind, strength, all of that on the inside gets strengthened. Okay, so point number two then. Pray for people and get prayed for to grasp, grasp the power of God's love. Look what the verses say. He says, your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should. I really like that little phrase there. It's because that's instructive for every single one of us, right? All God's people should understand this. Pray you have the power to understand it. How wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Mind is not going to get it. But in your heart and experience, you're going to experience it as you grasp it. So may you have the power to understand it even though you won't fully understand it. May you have the power to experience it and live it, though you won't fully understand it. So immediately you and I are being drawn through prayer into the mysterious, into the deep waters of God. I won't understand it all, but please come and fill me and show me and teach me and move me by your Holy Spirit to do what you want me to do. Um, the, uh, the memorial yesterday was so fun because there were so many people from a wide variety of background, from early shoreline days. One woman came over here and she said, you know, Boogie was the person who would always put me to work at church. She, he would look at me and go, hey, you spot it, you got it. Those chairs aren't going to set themselves up, right? Let's go, sister. And it, she goes, whenever he came around the corner, I was like, oh, no, oh, no, he's going to tell me what to do. Um, and she said, but quickly I realized he was doing that because he was doing it with you, that kind of a thing. And then another mom was up here on stage, Hoku, and she was singing, and Hoku said when she went to Branch's church, where Boogie was the pastor, she said from her dysfunctional family background, she knew she needed God's word to remake her life. And she said, when I came to the church, I had all of these Bible verses and knowledge in my head, but she said, from my background, I had not experienced love the way that it ought to be given. So she said, I was like a, it was like I, I didn't know how to grow. I didn't know how to interact with the church family. I didn't know how to participate. I just felt uncomfortable and awkward all the time. And she said, Boog and Steph just drew me in. And not only would they help me figure out what to do, but they would constantly love me with God's love and tell me that it was God's love and then pray for me with God's love. And she said, it was the experience of love in community that took all my Bible knowledge head and made sense out of it all in my life. She said, it wasn't until I saw love up close and real that I began to understand what I believed. Isn't that interesting? Just what we talked about in the beginning. If that head knowledge can't drop 18 inches down into our heart, it won't impact our spiritual growth in the way it needs to. And prayer is the mechanism whereby I take my head knowledge and translate it into my heart knowledge. And that my heart's what drives my life. And your heart is what drives your life as well. There's two things in this, these verses, um, from the, just from the one before and this one, but it, it's two analogies that Paul puts together. He says, may you be rooted and grounded. So notice that. Rooted is, the, is a tree analogy. The roots go down deep, and grounded is a foundation of a house. So he's saying, may your roots go down deep and your house go up high. Two directions at the same time, and he mixes those. One biological and then one terrestrial, if you will. But he's saying, may you be rooted and grounded in Christ. Because it's going to be who you are spiritually in him and how that shows up in your real life with other people that are all around you. And he goes, man, I want you to just know the power of God to both give you the grounding you need and help you love other people who are around you. I, I want you to have both of those in your life. Well, how do we access that power? And he says, Christ has to come make his home in your heart. Christ has got to dwell in your heart. He's, and, and so dwell, that we, was just in the verse before this that we looked at, is a fun Greek word. It's called kata oikeo. It's house. We looked at that last week, oikos. Put together with um, within or, or with and in. So you have kata oikeo becomes a word that means to settle down into a permanent residence. What is he praying he said, I am praying for you, Ephesians, that Christ would take up permanent residence in your heart. That this wouldn't just be like something I heard about, but that it would be experienced deeply in my heart. And why does he want that? He says, 
when you look at your heart, your heart is like a home. Well, what's the opposite of Christ taking up permanent residence in my heart? Well, the danger is that Christ may just become a guest in your heart. And you know what you do for guests when they come into your home? You try as best you can to pretend that everything looks and sounds and feels great for two hours until they leave. And then when they leave, the real you shows up. Finally, we can argue and fight and throw the pillows around again or whatever it is. He says, no, I want Christ to take up permanent residence. There's a lot of people who have written about this. And here's just four rooms of your heart that Christ wants to come into. He wants to come into the family room of your heart. What happens in the family room of a home? That is where decisions are made, where prayer takes place, where families join together, make decisions, talk to each other, have hard talks about truth and relationship. The family room is, is the place of decisions and talking together, and Christ wants to be in the middle of your family discussions. He wants to come into the dining room. What happens in the dining room? Think of the dining room as connected to the kitchen. The kitchen, dining room, that whole system in your house, that's the hub of your house. That is the place where your whole house revolves around that because the food system of your house is the fellowship system of your house. So that's why so many of you have islands in your kitchens and around. Um, we do, we have an island and it is the place of fellowship. So if we have house guests, believers and non-believers, we have both that come and stay in our house. We always gather them in a circle around our island. If, if, if it's a small circle, we lean in and grab hands or whatever because it's a big island. But we join hands around the island and we actually have a little extended prayer before meals, but it's right in the middle of the hub of the house because your kitchen is where all the warmth, where all the fellowship, where all the connectivity is happening. Food and fellowship have gone together biblically since the very beginning. So connect those to Christ in your home. We keep a little Bluetooth speaker on our island, and of course we connect to that all the time, and we play worship music. Sometimes we play Jack Johnson and John Mayer, fair enough, but... When, when it's not Jack Johnson and John Mayer, um, it, it's a worship mix from our, our community island in the house, just bringing Christ to the center, and that's the place where we always gather for prayer. But you bring Christ into your kitchen, your dining room, that fellowship relationships that are in your home. Um, here's, a, here's a room to think about bringing Christ into the bedroom. And think about how the bedroom has been taken offline by the world and the internet and the movies and the TV of what so many humans have learned that they think the bedroom is supposed to be. And think of how wrong that goes. But what if you brought Christ into the center of your bedroom and what was to happen or not happen in that room and you brought Christ right into the center of that and you said, Lord Jesus, you are the Lord of this bedroom. You gotta bring him in there. And so the family room, the dining room, the bedroom, last room I'll mention is the closets of our house. And what do we do with our closets? We put all the stuff in there that is unattractive and that we don't want people to see and we push it behind the door and we close the door. And Christ says, you know it's there and I know it's there. Open those closet doors, let it out and let me in. Christ wants to take a permanent residence in your heart, not just a guest, not just a visitor, and not somebody you're trying to trick and let in and let out, but you're living with him, settled down, dwelling in your heart and in mine. That's the only way, actually, to experience his love and his presence, is to let him all the way in. You won't experience it otherwise. So he's truly praying that Christ would come in, make his home in their hearts, and that they would experience the love of Christ. I love this four-way depth that he talks about here. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should. So you're supposed to know how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. What are we talking about? Some writers have talked about this a lot, but think of the width of God's love. And here's one. God's love reaches to the entire world. He sent his son. So in the end, God will have worshiping people before his throne from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, and every people. God's love is so wide, it reaches all people. How long is God's love? Go back as far as you can in your mind into eternity past, and his love is there. Go as far forward into the future as you can, God's love is there. How high is God's love? Where can God lift sinful people? He takes Jews and Gentiles from sinful separatedness and he seats us in the heavenly places with Christ. He takes us all the way to the victory that is in Christ and lifts us up.
How deep does his love go? His love reaches the depths of the farthest away lost sinner. It goes as deep as a person can be lost and his love is there. There's nobody farther than God can love. He loves them in that faraway place. So wide enough for the world, long enough as forever, high enough to lift us to heaven and deep enough to rescue the lost no matter where they are. We are, we are called to know that love and think of all the missionary words that are in there of how to love other people as well. Going and finding people in their place of lostness. Going to tell them the good news that Christ is victorious. Going to love them no matter where they are or where they're coming from out of this world. And so, where does that all leave us? Let's ask ourselves a question and then we'll close. Here's our question. Am I growing more and more to know this unknowable love of Christ? Do I know his love experientially more today than I did a year ago? And if not, then just increase your prayer life. Just Dig into your prayer life and just really open it up. Prayer is not a place to be perfect. It's a place to be honest. And start right where you are and press in. Number three, pray for others and get prayed for to be filled up with God. And this is where he ends. He says, then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Just as a balloon inflates when we blow into it. So the Bible deepens and expands our life and our capacity so that we're filled increasingly like an expanding balloon with the fullness of God. Those were the three things that he prayed for for the Ephesians, three things that you and I can be praying for each other and should be, to know God's love, to experience his power for spiritual growth, and to know the fullness of God in our experience. There's more experience of God just beyond where you are right now, and he wants you to grow spiritually into that. Today's prayer is an invitation. So would you all stand with me as we close today? And as we close, I'm going to have us all read together in unison and out loud, verses 20 and 21. We've put them up here on the screen. I'll try to enunciate a little slower, but see if you can just stick with me, and let's all read it together out loud, and then we'll pray. Are you ready? Starting at verse 20. Now all glory to God, who is able, through his mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Yes, Father. Our hearts resonate with that today. All glory to God. You are the able one. You are the mighty one. You are the power at work within us through your Holy Spirit, through your word, through your strength, through salvation, through your love. You are accomplishing more in us than we even know to ask you for, Lord. So we ask you for great things, Lord. The greatest things we can think of, Lord, that you would be honored and glorified in our lives and through our lives. Help us love each other in new ways, self-sacrificially, not selfishly. Help us give up of ourselves for the good of others around us. Love covers over a multitude of sins. So help our relationships to say, I'm not waiting for you to change to love you. I love you now today with God's love. He forgave me. I forgive you. Let's move forward in love. And so, Lord, you are accomplishing so much good in us and through us. And we give ourselves to it. Lastly, Lord, this passage said that you would do this through all generations forever and ever. And we look back on the generation of the 1960s and the the Jesus Revolution. Movie, movie showed us a great example of that generation, how they came out of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and how they came instead to Christ Jesus and a new way of what love was, what it looked like, uh, what purity was, what it looked like, what joy was, and how to celebrate, Lord. And you remade that generation in so many ways through what we have said, the Jesus movement. Now today, Lord, in our generation, people are stepping forward in baptism. They're stepping forward in faith and belief. They're stepping forward for a new empowerment, Lord. And we pray that you would have your way to do even more than we're asking right now, to fill us, change us, and work through us for your glory and our good. We lay it all at your feet in Jesus' name. Amen.